There's something really special about juicing fresh fruit. In. You get all these minerals and vitamins and nutrients. And to taste the finished product in the bottle is just something special. It's something that is so remarkably complex, but just fits so well together in one simple package. I meet so many people who say, oh no, I don't drink cider. And, and I turn around to them and say, well, you have to try this because I think I was like you. And once they try it, they, they fall in love with it. And our whole mission with what we're doing here is to show people that this isn't a, a commercial sweet thing that gets you buzzed or that would be your first drink when you're underage because that's what generally cider is in this country. It's about the artisanal, making something with his hands, uh, bring it to the people and it's, it's about almost presenting their passion. It's if they're bottling their passion and giving it to the customer and cider, this craft cider is just like that. To start any revolution you need a spark, you need something driving the revolution, somebody who can jump over those barriers um, that are put in our place. So yeah, here we go, let's do it. My dad has been involved in the brewing from a process engineering side since I can remember. So I've been watching him build machines and filters and, and keg lines and that since I was about 12. So I've always been really intrigued. My father-in-law who owns Windermere Farm, um, originally started Windermere Cider in 1994 and he actually has all the apples and he was looking back then already for an alternative to, to just general farming and agriculture. We had that eureka moment saying, this makes so much sense. My husband grows the apples. They start with these little flowers on the trees in October. By February, they have apples this size. We start pruning. By May-ish, we are we're picking and, and we're pressing and the apples are this size. They're juicy, they're golden. And when you press them, just this juice that just pours out and it's just an abundance of sugar and it just tastes amazing. And then about nine months later, after it's finished with the French oak, you pour it out of the tank and you're like, oh my gosh, this apple was here for a higher purpose and this is it. Ireland really is a special place. It's got amazing colours. The, the, the 40 shades of green when you step off the plane, it's just quite incredible, it is so green. And that gentle drain all the time, it makes for incredible rich dark soil, which makes for an amazing apple. And then these apples have been bred for generations, specifically for cider flavours. So it's just as important as uh, terroirs and wine is where the apples come from, is where you make it, who makes it, how you make it, your intention behind it. And with Orpins, we're really trying to bring in sort of Irish tradition. The team in, in, involved in Orpins is basically three guys. There's a guy called Chris Hill, Matt Tindall and Bruce Jack. But the name comes from Chris Hill's grandmother, whose name was Charmian Hill, whose maiden name was Orpin. She was known as the Galloping Granny. She owned a horse called Dawn Run, who was a, quite a famous horse. And she raced it on his first three races at the age of 62 and won the last one. We like to bring that same kind of spirit into, into, into the Orphans. You have to choose the best flavors, and you have to press it and only use the best juice and look after it. And then if it does that, you hopefully win the race. We've been in the wine industry together for many years, and uh, this was just sort of a natural evolution of that relationship. I think what makes the partnership great here as well is this is not about two guys who decided to make cider one day. We actually grow apples as well. We know where the apple orchards are. Um, we, we, we understand apples and, and as Bruce said, coming from the winemaking background, is, is then taking fruit and capturing the essence of that fruit and putting it into the bottle. The Kluvers are one of the biggest apple growers in the world probably, definitely one of the biggest in South Africa. And we've been able to select specific varieties from specific sections of the farm, from a specific age of trees for the cider. That's a, it's an incredibly unique opportunity that very few other people have. And being technically proficient allows us to kind of uh, uh, not only have the, the creativity and whatever, but it's, it's to make sure that what we put in the bottle is brilliant. And that's what it's all about. I think that's an important thing with a cider is that there's this almost an overlap between there's a bit of the wine culture, a bit of the craft beer culture and obviously the cider culture. The Clarence Brewery with their red stone cider, which it's, it's all about passion. I mean they conveyed their passion for craft beer and what they've been doing at their brewery for so many years. But now they've taken this whole love of the area they come from and the Maluti Mountains and the Red Stone and gone to this red stone cider which I think is a great little expression of what they care about and where they come from. My name's William Everson. We are now in the home of Everson Cider, actually, where it started off. 
I made a bit, like a small bit, like a thousand litres at first, right here with a basket press, and I think that's when the light bulb went on. Use the same bit of equipment that you've got, very handcrafted, very small scale. We put our name on the bottle. You've got a certain standard to, to meet with that, and it's great to have the rest of the family involved. This is one of our barrel cellars. We aged some of the products, like the single varietal um, was aged in French oak barrels for 12 months. And uh, we aged a mix of apple and pear cider in those brandy casks for 12 months and blended it with a little bit of faint boss honey. And that's where we really like to play and show people that we are still progressive and we're still experimenting with different styles. And there's a skill set here that was, that was learned at, at a viticulture school. It's to make wine. The process is so akin to each other. It takes the same amount of time and skill set to produce this product. This isn't something that we just churn out in order to make a lot of money. We're, like, it really that's makes it. Something got it. We've got yeah. our name on the bottle. We're trying to show people that there's something really cool here and they should definitely give it a try. I was once, uh, I was once in a nightclub recently and you know they were playing this song here in Cape Town and it said, every day I'm hustling. I said, every day I'm hustling. I'm hustling, I'm hustling. And then, you know, I kept thinking, you know, this, this is exactly for, you know, the story of living in South Africa. Every day you gotta hustle. Every day you gotta work for a buck. You gotta work to get through the, you know, all the telecoms of this world. You gotta work through all your licensing issues. You gotta work through absolutely everything in order to make something operate in South Africa. So every single day I go to work, I just sing it to myself every morning. Every day I'm hustling and I'm celebrating this guy <laughs> right at the top of the pile. And that's where we want to be and that's where we want you to be when you're drinking this cider, absolutely on top of the world. To us, you know, hustling became a real part of what, we, what we're about um, in doing this. And a word that perfectly captured that for us was a squally. So I, I think, you know, this is why I always talk about a revolution because what we need to demonstrate is just like craft beer came to challenge the SABs of this world. Craft Cider is also able to create a better handcrafted, more involved, more evolved cider. Single varietal concept is really important. We chose Golden Delicious because it's Africa's darling apple. It's made in a wine style, so we use the same process that you would to make the, the first part of a, of a sparkling wine. So I won't go into all the details of that, but the result is a cider that tastes like a Golden Delicious apple. So drink a scully, get on top of the world, and hustle on. What I love about cider is when you open a bottle, you can taste the farm, you know, you can taste where that apple tree came from. It's really something quite special. It's so compl complex and so, but so enjoyable that it can actually be enjoyed by everyone. Boys shouldn't feel that their masculinity has been compromised by taking a sip of cider, because you certainly don't feel that way when you have a glass of wine. There's nothing dodgy in here. There's apples in here. It's not sickly sweet. And if you can imagine biting into an apple, you don't get that horribly sweet sensation in your mouth. You get a lovely, refreshing, crisp feeling. And I think that's what makes this product so amazing. There's an argument that you could, you could have drunk something very similar to this three, 4,000 years ago. Nothing has changed in that time, and that's quite cool. These are our apples which are grown here. So, you know, why not take a bite? Or actually even more easily, you don't even need to bite. You can just sip, get a straw, you know, get some ice and, you know, don't get ice. Put in an apple, put in cinnamon, do whatever you want with it. Just drink the stuff because uh, I think you'll enjoy it. The cider revolution is only just kicking off right now. I mean, these revolutions depend a lot on the consumer, so how well people take to the passion that these producers have put together. But for me, it's more about let's get a cool product, let's expose people to what they're really doing because I think all of these guys working together are doing a great job of growing the cider market and the cider revolution.